All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next panel is titled Tenant Experience. What technologies are essential to tenants in 2021? Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. And I'll hand it over to our moderator, Brian. Thank you very much, Patrika. It's an honor to be here today. I'm very excited to hear from our panelists. And uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Brian Plymel. I'm with Heinz, the uh, fourth largest real estate investment management company in, in the world. We have, uh, I oversee our operations in Southern California and Las Vegas, and I'm, I'm very intrigued to hear from our panel, uh, their perspectives. And so I'm gonna turn it over to them to introduce themselves. And uh, why don't we kick it off with having uh, Vicki introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Vicky. Um, so I am the CEO and also the founder of One Piece Work. So basically what we have been doing in the past five years is we are a flexible workspace operator that so far we have already operated to five cities, including 11 locations uh, in both China and US. We provided a uh, flexible working experience to a lot of tech companies, including Lime Bike, Impossible Food, not only just by helping them to launch their flexible office solutions, the same times we also help them to scale to different cities as they grow. Um, so on the other side, we also help a lot of uh, stressed landlord to transfer their workspace to a flexible workspace by a seamless digital experience. Very nice to meet everyone. And then I really look forward to learn more about, you know, the tenant experience through this session. Great. Thank you, Vicki. How about mm -hmm. Kyle? Yeah, Brian, thank you. Uh, my name is Kyle Waltrip. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Dotted. Dotted is a uh, lease workflow platform for a commercial office, uh, industrial and retail space. And we're based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, launched actually last year, uh, Dotted has now accumulated tens of millions of square feet on this platform, and we uh, work with owners to get tenants in uh, to their spaces as fast as possible, starting with the tenant inquiry and rolling all the way to the tenant move-in. So excited to be here, excited to uh, speak with the panel about tenant experience. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Corey. Uh, I'm Corey Clark. I'm VP of Product Management within RxR's Digital Lab. So RxR is one of the larger landlords within New York City, uh, around 26 million square feet of commercial property. Uh, and Digital Lab is basically a technology startup within RxR. So uh, we have around 30 people on our team across software developers, data scientists, designers, building tools and software for our buildings and for our tenants. Fantastic. Very interesting. So good, good mix of people here today. I know uh, we also have Jessica on here, uh, backing up Vicky, um, and uh, she may be hopping in uh, at, at some point in time, discussing what uh, what One Piece is doing. Um, but let me open up the question here, or the questioning, the the discussion. How are operating systems impacting the office of the future? And as you answer that question. Tell us what your view of operating system is. So uh, who'd like to take it from the top? Corey, maybe since you're, you're talking uh, big systems, big buildings, why don't you start with you? Sure, yeah, I, I, you know, for us, we're really defining our operating system more as, as the data platform, um, you know, bringing in data from the buildings um, and obviously all the space information, how it's utilized, air quality, you know, energy meters, but then also information about how people are using the space and, and the people side as well. So um, looking at presence information uh, and even working with our tenants to pull in digital collaboration data so we can really get a full picture of how the space is being used and why and where. Um, so like that is for us that the operating system, that, that data layer. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the lens that we look through all of our technology through is just, you know, how much data it can give us and, and um, you know, whether it's following like kind of the standards that allow us to be as interoperable as possible across our portfolio. Certainly, and, and I'm curious, so these are multi-tenant office buildings that you're describing. Is that across throughout the building, whether single tenant or large tenant, small tenant, everybody, everybody's data is being uh, analyzed by you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, from all the data that we can get in terms of how people are coming into the building, how they're using their space and then you know, working with the tenants within their space to also, you know, process their data and, and share uh, insights with them. Um, you know, and and so very privacy focused in all the work we're doing. So we're not tracking people. Um, you know, we're tracking how space is being used. So 
Um, but it is, yeah, data from all of our tenants and in, in, in all of our buildings. Got it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Kyle, how about from your, in your world? <laughs> sure. I actually had a, a little bit of a question for Corey. Um, I assume obviously COVID and some of the return to work or non-return to work that y'all are uh, experiencing. Uh, I'm in Texas, you're in New York, so it's a little bit different. Uh, geographic location with different restrictions going back uh, months and months. How do y'all view the data that you're collecting now um, even differently than you viewed it, let's call fall of 2019? Or is that not changed or has, has, has that changed? Uh, it's changed a little bit. I mean, there was, you know, the reopened the offices, you know, June of last year. So there was definitely an emphasis on getting more like health and environmental data, just so that people knew that our buildings were safe. Um, so that was something that we weren't as focused on, um, and has become kind of a baseline that people seem to want going forward. Um, but uh, I think the other thing that has changed kind of because of COVID is um, more transparency around the data. So it's not necessarily the data that we're collecting, but actually you know, we're sharing it with our tenants and everybody in the building. So the most popular feature in our app is the feature where anyone walking in the building can see how crowded the lobby is, check the air quality, even find out data about the environment around them, you know, how busy traffic is within the neighborhood, COVID cases within the neighborhood for now. Um, so that transparency piece is something that's really changed and, and we're leaning into heavily kind of even, you know, post COVID. Yeah, very cool. The reason I ask is because we uh, I've dealt with a lot of Southern landlords, um, office, industrial retail, and and the office folks are, you know, definitely very, uh, very in tune with the space utilization data um, and trying to understand, you know, even down to how many parking spaces are being filled in the in the garages, either underneath or next to the buildings. And, and that obviously correlates to, to activity and, and hopefully to movement. And, and for office owners, of course, uh, they want people to return back to the space, uh, similar to uh, some of our same desires here at Dada, we want to see space utilized and, and vacancies filled. Um, I think what's what's been unique is uh, in the conversations we've had with our customers, some of this data just wasn't as prevalent in discussion even two years ago. And now it's, I mean, it's the end all be all. It is, it is informing decision making quickly. Uh, and especially on a market by market basis is uh, dotted has a you know more national view of of how things are moving just based on our customer base. Uh, we're getting to see uh, different markets and how they're moving and how they're trying to optimize that data, uh, especially in relation to government regulation um, and the way things have opened up or not opened up in certain states. So that's the reason I ask. Yeah, and I mean occupancy data was something we were really leaning into pre-COVID and you know down to the space and the desk. So that isn't a new thing for us. I think one thing that we have been pulling in lately is data that doesn't relate to the space. Um, and that's, you know, because our tenants are asking for a comprehensive picture of work, not just the space mm -hmm. that we lease them. So, you know, we are pulling in information that will allow them to understand, you know, how, how often people are working remotely, what they're doing remotely. Um, and so they can really understand, you know, are people coming into the office to collaborate? Are they coming in to do focus work? Are they spending time at home doing collaboration? We can really optimize their whole portfolio, us being just one component of it. Very cool. Yeah, that's it's really fascinating. I'm curious how how actionable is the data that you're able to report to the tenants is at an individual level or at a company level? Do are decisions being made that, that impact you as a landlord that impact their tenant behavior or their their employee behavior and and what are the pros and cons of that? Uh, hard to say. <laughs> you know, so we're still, <laughs> um, you know, some of our buildings in Long Island are up to like 60, 70 percent occupancy, um, but uh, you know the New York City portfolio. Really, it's still, you know, it's, it's gone up a good bit in the last couple of weeks, honestly, but we're still at maybe 15, 20%. So, and, and most of our tenants are um, really just, they're still trying to get like just back in the office. Um, sure, and sure. then they're going to spend 2021 kind of capturing the data and then start making decisions after that in terms of optimizing the space. Most people seem to be kind of like wait and see. So, they are looking for this data to make decisions, but yeah, to be honest, no one's really made any decisions on it yet. Got it. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Well, shifting gears a bit here, Vicki, can you tell us uh, 
in your world, uh, operating systems that that uh, are uh, governing your your business? Yeah, so I would say you know it's definitely very different that you know um, there are two type of or different type of landlords, right? So there is the race kind of like driven landlords. Basically, they care about efficiency through like capital reduce of the capital use, right? And then there is the cash flow landlords, which is the typical landlords that we constantly deal with, right? So they care about you know how in long term wise they can increase uh, capacity and also increase uh, the vacancy or decrease the vacancy rate while decrease the, the direct costs. So those are kind of, you know, um, the solutions or uh, the problems that we have in solving. Therefore, you know, um, so we definitely seen that in our field. Um, so in terms of, you know, operating system, the largest thing that we have to deal with is actually the kind of like the hospitality perspective, which means, you know, uh, by providing or by applying uh, the certain technology, we wanted to make sure that we are able to centralize all the clients request because the tenants, they're everywhere. We have 11 locations. And then each of the tenants, they have very customized requests through different cities. And, you know, so we definitely wanted to be there for them on demand 24 seven. But the thing is, you know, in real practice, it's challenging and it's also it's hard. And also we have to deal with landlords because landlords are not able to provide everything that is available, you know, to support the tenants. Therefore, we as, you know, the middle kind of like uh, vendor in between, we actually have to make that happen. So therefore, you know, we kind of like rely on technology such as, you know, marketplace, which can constantly, you know, contribute lead generation to our platform. And also we have to kind of like heavily rely on some of the technology which can reduce the unnecessary communication in between, you know, the ticketing system and also, you know, billing and listing system, things like that. So we found those are really helpful in order to help us to decrease the direct cost. However, you know, we all still maintain the same level of, of hospitality to increase the revenue in long term. So that's just kind of like our feedback from, you know, the field in the flex workspace, you know, what constantly we have been dealing with and also what's the kind of like landlords are looking for. They're definitely, you know, care more about the cash rather than uh, the capital efficiency per square footage on the actual kind of like uh, uh, management in the office space by itself. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit different perspective. <laughs> sure. And in your model, is are you on a, on a lease with your landlords or are you in a uh, partnership with your landlords? Yeah, we're, we have both. But right now okay. we have 75% of them we're on a partnership. Okay. So what we will do is we actually, we provide um, our internal development, we provide uh, our software, and also we provide our network through all 11 cities to help this landlord to generate uh, short-term cash, long-term lead generation, and also, you know, at some time, we can also improve them to increase their asset value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now that, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. And they... Um... I, uh, do you, do you, are you, are you, uh, do you operate in like full floor blocks or are they uh, smaller amounts than that? Yeah. So we only occupy single uh, standalone building and okay. uh, yeah, the average size is about uh, 35K to 75K. And you have control over the entire building then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very good. That, uh, that's that's very interesting, and it sort of leads into our, our next uh, um, topic, and and on on how uh, hospitality plays a role in the office building. You've described Vicky what what you're doing for the customers that that you work with, uh, who are direct customers of yours, mm-hmm. and I, I'm curious, uh, Corey, from your perspective, how how are you uh, integrating hospitality in the commercial office, multi tenant office space? Sure. Yeah. And this, uh, we're leaning pretty heavily into the hospitality piece as well. So, you know, along with the technology products we've been developing, we're also developing service products. So, you know, we've introduced within our buildings, a new role called the RXO or the RXR experience officer. Uh, and they are, you know, specifically focused at the occupant, the end user, you know, where most landlords are servicing the tenant, the person that signed the lease and is paying the bill, but the, you know, thousands of people come in and out of the building every day, not our customer. Um, You know, we're, we're making a big shift and really focusing on that end user as our customer. So we've introduced this, this role as well as, you know, a series of apps and, um, and other services, including food and beverage, direct to desk delivery, we're piloting 
Um, and, and we feel like we really just need to make sure that that end customer is happy because then their, you know, their employer or our tenant will be happy and, uh, and so forth. And we've seen, you know, COVID's definitely accelerating that because, um, at least in New York, there's a, a massive flight to, to quality. Um, you know, there is surplus real estate in the market. Um, and, uh, you know, what we've seen from just leasing across, across the, the region is people are moving towards class A, high service buildings. So, you know, we have to provide that hospitality just to obviously compete. I, it, it would sound then that the, uh, as you say, the traditional office or landlord office uh, contact uh, relationship is sort of the uh, the key there. Where your model, it sounds like you got all of your occupants are your customers. So um, technology seems fairly essential to making that work. Is that what? How do you? How have you uh, taken technology? to help you engage with those customers and take care of them. Yeah, I, part of it is, you know, introducing a tenant experience app, which, you know, is, is fairly common at this point. So we have that direct channel of communication. Um, and then it's been rolling out a lot of uh, tools to kind of automate that communication because yes, we have these experience and hospitality officers, but some of our buildings have, you know, 10,000 people coming in them every day. We can't, you know, maintain a personal relationship with each of them <laughs> that easily. Right. So, you know, being able to operate at scale means, you know, introducing and, and you know, using ML to train a chat box so that they can give a kind of personalized experience without having to have someone be, you know, behind that chatting, um, you know, getting the data on how amenities are used, putting in, you know, occupancy trackers within all of our people counters within all of our amenities to just monitor that usage throughout the day. Um, and also kind of building predictive analytics against some of our other data sources so that we can catch problems beforehand and, you know, jump in and, and make sure that we're kind of um, providing that level of service that one would expect from, yeah, a hotel or something else. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then Vicky, how, and then on your end, technology, you've got customers all over the world. How, how's technology helping you deliver the hospitality experience for your customers? Right, so I think uh, speaking of that, hospitality to us comes from two angles. One angle is, you know, you are there when they need help 24 seven on demand, which means, you know, you can leverage um, existing kind of like operating systems such as, you know, booking system to help your clients to book room anywhere that they travel to or book any kind of like office they travel to. So those kind of like technology basically rely that very heavily on solve the on-demand request, which not necessarily we have to have a person to be there, you know, to solve all this kind of like needs. It's very hands-off. However, there is another type of hospitality. Basically, you know, it's not necessarily already there. However, we have to be there, you know, to understand our clients and also to discover what's the potential needs they might want. And then we wanted to be there to support that. Therefore, you know, my understanding of that is, you know, from the hospitality perspective, not only just by kind of like showing that we're there, we also have to provide actual in-person experience at, you know, each location that we operate to enter, to generate a chances meeting or chances kind of like a chat to understand that. So one of the example is, you know, when we first built San Francisco office, um, so basically it was just purely kind of like office. And then a um, couple of weeks later, so our community manager expressed something that they would want to have for San Francisco office. Basically there were like two women, they actually just delivered a baby. However, they still have to come to the office occasionally, right? For that, they realized that, you know, that this two ladies, they are not necessarily requesting that they want a nursing room to be in the office, but our community manager discovered that through communication with that, and then, you know, the hospitality level they bring in is they wanted to give what they want, but not necessarily they request. And that's how we understand what's the best hospitality should stand. You know, technology cannot re really replace everything. Technology in the hospitality piece can only be there, you know, to help decrease the unnecessary labor cost. But the true hospitality, especially in flex space, is to provide a market space to support all this potential needs from our clients and also to continuously unlocking more and more possibilities to bring into the space.
So that's, you know, how we understand it. So definitely, you know, we need both technology pieces of that and also the inhuman interaction there to support the whole uh, ecosystem. Oh, that's a great point. I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in a people business and technology simply helps and augments what we do as human beings. But um, some the, the scale sometimes gets overwhelming, but it still comes down to people being able to deliver the, the services and the attention. And as you just described, a face to face interaction that led to an innovation in, in one of your facilities. Right, because that's actually really what it is to drive up the retention rate which in flexible workspace, actually lead generation is not the most difficult retention is. And you definitely mm -hmm. need a great hospitality there to support the system. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Kyle, you look like you were about to say something about- Yeah, I think I'll take, I'll take my technology hat off and I'll put my tenant hat on. I, there you go. Uh, uh, maybe crazily signed a, a new lease here in a submarket in a class A building here in Dallas uh, literally 60 days ago. So. Uh, call me nuts, call me the only person signing a new lease in uh, March of 2021, but um, I'm a big believer that the tenant engagement and that experience starts at the inquiry. Uh, it starts at the first moment that you may be in some way, you know, related or associated with that new potential building. And, and you know, to what Corey was talking about, it's a fascinating comment that he made that Yes, the the in payers, you know, the person signing the lease. Obviously, they're the they're the person responsible. But it really does come down to the tenants and and what that tenant experience is like in the building. And uh, to Corey's point, like we moved uh, from a nice building here in Dallas uh, to an even nicer building that we felt like had better amenities. It was closer to a few of our customers. It allowed us a more central location, but it also gave us some of the hospitality and experiences that we just weren't getting at the other building. And and for a a technology company uh, where you may think, you know, we've got a lot of uh, deaf people that don't care about experience. Uh, we've got all of our people care about experience. Uh, I've got engineers on my team that came to me the first day we moved in and asked me where the gym was. And, and you know, it's just, it's small stuff. And uh, that engagement really does start at the inquiry. And that really does flow through the life cycle of the lease. I mean, I look at uh, tenant engagement apps like an HQO or something like that, that uh, have have helped change some of the game and better understanding how tenants are moving, why they're moving, where they're moving, and what they're experiencing uh, from an eight to six workday. And it's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great story. And um, you mentioned tenant experience apps, and I, 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 I'm always fascinated to hear different stories about those and how, how well they work. And sometimes apps can be a, a, a solution in search of a problem. And sometimes apps can be the, the gold nugget that people are looking for to make their life better at work. So um, what are some of the things that you all have seen in terms of app uh, value in your, in your various businesses that have really made the app, where the app is act, has really been an enhancement, not just something cool to carry on your phone? I'll, open, I'll start. Open I'll question. Yeah, go, go. Um, yeah, so... Uh, dotted is not a dot it's not a in in building tenant experience app it's a it's a true asset management lease uh, workflow platform but uh, in a lot of ways what dotted is is meant to do is is take static commenting and static reporting and make it uh, really more of a, of a personal assistant throughout your entire workday we fully believe that uh, workflow transparency and vertical integration of real estate organizations uh, should empower uh, leasing and asset management decisions to better serve tenants and if tenants are being better served, that means there's less downtime uh, from the time a tenant inquires to the time a lease is signed and also on the backside uh, from space construction all the way to move in. And so there's just a thesis around our product that uh, if you have better data up front, you're gonna have better up outputs on the back. Now, I can't control people. I can't force people to work a certain way. Um, I can't force people to be on top of everything, but uh, from a dotted perspective, if there's less um, friction in the lease process and the build-out process, that should lead uh, to a better tenant experience, at least getting in the space. Um, and then, of course, you know, once you're in the space, and I think uh, I can hand it off to Corey because my some of my job a little bit ends, uh, but what we've seen in our new move is uh, this experience in the space is, is some of what Vicky was talking about. The, the retention word is huge. And we love our building that we've just moved to, but, you know, in my view, I'm still a customer uh, looking for space in the future. 
and uh, that this building, this landlord, and is going to have to kind of earn that right, earn that right to keep my business. And there's, I think, a whole host of things that can go into that. So I'll turn it over to Corey or Vicky, who may have a little bit more experience in that space. Yeah, maybe just a comment about kind of earning the right. I think what we found is like, in order to really get into the experience piece, we kind of first have to just you know, earn the right to do that by providing the basic utility and we kind of really have to have that layer that's, you know, work orders, visitor management, you know, mobile access, like all of that stuff has to work perfectly and exist all within the app. And then, then we can start providing kind of the, the, the higher order um, experience pieces and, you know, start um, engaging our tenants with you know, polls, virtual events, like some of the what would be a nice way to have that we really need that basic you know utility in there um to ensure that we have engagement but also to, to earn that trust um we've also found that we kind of can't really just focus on the building itself um and then kind of pretend that everything within the tenants walls is their problem but you know the end occupant again they walk into the building they unlock the building door they go through the turnstiles and then they want to go in their own door you know and they want to be able to use the same app for their office and their whole workplace experience, whether it's inside of the wall or outside of the wall, doesn't really matter. It's all the office to them. So, you know, we've had to, you know, figure out ways to integrate with our tenants system so that we can provide that, that full kind of employee experience, not just building experience. Right. Yeah. And also, I think from my perspective, um, so, you know, uh, the app is more about an integration kind of like solution for a centralized community or on-demand, um, how to say that, kind of storage there, you know, which enable every client of us to be able to access to certain communication with our community managers everywhere. Because, you know, at different times, um, our tenants have different requests. When we had, you know, a lot of people like constantly coming to the space, you know, we definitely have to host a lot of events what we see, you know, the app being consumed the most is actually ticketing to, to different kind of events. So, you know, people have the time for it and then people crave for a different kind of like entertainment. So we definitely see that. However, you know, during COVID, we see things are very, very different that, you know, people wanted to use a lot of, you know, new type of te technology, which actually to get ease of their health kind of like concern in the workspace. So for example, like online booking, which they go there, you know, the office is already cleaned, they know the office is already cleaned, and then they can just have the meeting done and stuff like that. So we've seen this kind of feature actually definitely used more. And then even though we still host hosted a lot of like virtual events, but the thing is, you know, the vibe or the registration rate for that decreased much more. So, you know, I think, you know, in general, basically um, the application of the, the use of the app is basically just to be the concierge in our client's pocket that to show that we are there whenever they need it. That's all, <laughs> yeah. And does your app, your app is, is it an app of apps? Does it, uh, does it pull in other data or do you have, do your customers have more than, than one app that uh, governs what they do in your space? Yeah, so it's an all-inclusive kind of map app. We actually, we, we, we didn't really invent everything on our own. We actually mm -hmm. had to work with third party. But the mm -hmm. thing is, you know, we just wanted to focus on the hospitality perspective. Therefore, we integrate every kind of like possible features in there, all the way from onboarding um, to building and leasing kind of agreements, tracking, and to kind of like offboarding and also events, everything's in there. But the thing is, you know, we work with many third parties together to put this happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and for you as well, Corey, is, is, uh, do your employees, your, or I mean, not your employees, but your, your occupants, do they have multiple apps or do they just have the, the one RxR app? Uh, they just have the one app, uh, but huh? similar to Vicky's approach, you know, like we're building what we need to build, but buying what we what we can buy. Because there's, yep. you know, there's a lot of point solutions. A lot of it's just a commodity functionality. We don't want to reinvent it, but focusing yep. on the, building those key features that differentiate. Yeah, well, very uh, very interesting. And um, we uh, one of the things I wanted to, wanted to ask about, kind of shifting gears, but but back to what what you do for a living, Vicky, is the the uh, the future of flexible office space, mm -hmm. and uh, and I know, Vicky, you mentioned you're 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 helping owners of empty buildings by taking up of uh, and and utilizing that space as as uh, 
um, you know, for your your business. Um, do you also do you work with uh, within multi tenant office buildings as well? Mm -hmm. um, and what, what do you see as the future for your model? Yeah, so I think um, so. This is what we think about uh, the flexible workspace. We did have co-working space product, but you know, after running the co-working place, uh, the co-working space product for a while, I did notice a lot of pain points. The one of the largest pain points was, you know, we spend a lot of money and time to acquire on one early stage kind of like company or startup companies. However, they would not necessarily want it to stay there when they grow to team size of like 30 to 50, right? Something like that. They wanted to have their own office. They wanted to have their own meeting room. They also wanted to have their own community because not necessarily their people are still looking for community within the physical space. The community basically is their company. So therefore, you know, it's really sad for us to see that after spending so much time and money acquire this one client, however, when the big the biggest value is actually going to come in and then they had to leave because our service is no longer going to be able to satisfy their needs. So therefore, you know, in the past, I really, or during COVID, I really have been thinking, you know, what is really the future in flexible workspace? Is a co-working space tomorrow for flexible workspace, right? So I think co-working space is only going to become one type of it. And among all kind of like the percentage of the, the representative of the future workspace is probably only 10% or 20%, the maximum like that. Because, you know, it's more going to be catering the service to individual or smaller kind of like on-demand requests, that's all. And then, you know, when we look into the workspace or the office space, I have to look into, you know, what really happened in the past year today. So I think the traditional, the traditional office model is, you know, landlord and tenants, when they look into office leasing, the identity, the identity of office leasing they're looking for is total square footage. How many, what's the contract terms? What are the triple net costs? What are the sort of cost? And also what's the liabilities, right? And then definitely today's companies, they become much more distributed. And, you know, there are just much more kind of things going on. It's not able for them, you know, to sign up with the lease for five years or 10 years, right? So they're definitely looking for more flexible, more flexibility in terms of the term. Therefore, you know, they switch to look for a solution which can provide a moving ready space can provide a kind of like shorter term and also can reduce all this and 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 um, unnecessary negotiation to get the list done. Therefore, you know, this type of clients, they don't have the flexible working experience, which also means that a lot of landlords, I believe that they should start thinking, right? So in terms of the future of flexible workspace identities, instead of looking for, you know, the traditional value of that, they probably wanted to look for, first of all, how many headcounts for this company? Second of all, what's the lifetime value for this clients gonna stay in within their building? And then third of all is, you know, what's the employee satisfaction? Because right now office is no longer become, become a huge necessity. It's, it's more become a supportive tool for a lot of companies to acquire great talents in the future. Therefore, you know, employees satisfaction is actually very, very important, which a lot of landlords really have to think. So that's really what I believe that, you know, the identity of the future of, of office definitely shift from the physical space by itself to more of an experience driven kind of like uh, a solution, which, you know, the identity that we're looking for needs to, to, to be changed. And we need to have a better solution to, to, to provide those kind of like things to make it happen. Okay, very good. How about, Corey, how about RxR's perspective on, on flexible workspace? Yeah, so you know, I think our perspective is, you know, as a as a landlord, we really just need to provide space needs and kind of provide all the space needs for our tenants that may be in our space or it may not be. And, and the way we've been looking at flex is kind of three three buckets. So there are tenants that just want different leasing models than a traditional model. You know, they don't want 12, 15 year lease, they want a three year, maybe they want a one year and you know, so we're building pre-built suites and other options for leasing to kind of service that need. Uh, the second bucket are the uh, companies that need um, temporary space for an hour or a day um, to provide needs beyond their current space. So, you know, some of our tenants are shifting a lot of their spaces over to more collaboration and meeting spaces, and they don't have as many workspaces. 
So, you know, we're providing amenities within the building. So if they need to flex one day because everybody showed up, we have some desks that they can overflow into. Or if they don't have any more boardrooms because they got rid of them all, because, you know, who needs a 30 person boardroom to use once a year? You know, we have some of those within our buildings and you can flex into that. So providing just the ability to kind of quickly grab space outside of your kind of demised area um, is kind of the second need. And then the third is the remote worker. You know, so many of our tenants are, you know, coming to the office two, three days a week and working elsewhere. Uh, but those people that are working elsewhere maybe don't want to work at home, but they want to work somewhere that, you know, the kid isn't screaming or, you know, they have a more comfortable desk. So figuring out how to support that as a need and having that kind of larger network of flex space providers that we can basically bundle with our leases. Um, so that we can provide that full comprehensive offering from the remote work to the kind of short-term need to the kind of more flexible lease product. Yeah. I'm trying to think it all, but you know, doing it through yeah. partnerships and relationships. Yeah, yeah. How about Kyle? What what are you seeing in the in your customer base as sure. far as flex space use yeah. allocation? Yeah, I think landlords are becoming more flexible on term and 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 price and as they see fit to serve the customer's need, it's become uh, clearly a forefront conversation. And so what's interesting, we're seeing more spec suites on our platform as well. Uh, so um, going in and, and actually getting getting spaces really built out that are that are pretty flexible has, um, I mean, yeah, going a little bit past a white box space, obviously. Uh, but, you know, some things that have, have a few walls, but uh, really the tenant can come in and, and say, hey, we need to do this and we need to do that. And that was my story. So uh, we actually took a spec suite and the spec suite was kind of ready to go. And we did a few things to it, but uh, it was flexible and, and, you know, the, the landlords that we have on our platform, they're, they're very much just trying to meet the needs of the tenant. I will definitely tell you though, uh, that conversation has definitely sped up, uh, 18 months ago, uh, that, was, that was just a different, it's a different discussion across all types of landlords. And, um, to Vicky's point, you know, landlords operate totally differently. Like we have a few customers that operate in class B, uh, totally suburban office markets. Well, typically the tenants in those buildings are, are small family owned businesses. Uh, those people didn't go home even last March. I mean, it was, you know, they were still coming to the office because they had their individual walls, they had their doors, they could shut. And so occupancy in those assets still remain incredibly high. Um, but if you look at CBD or you look at uh, even um, in other sub markets here in Dallas, uh, where there's trophy assets and you've got, you know, million square feet buildings, uh, the vacancies were incredibly high. And so it really does depend on the tenant. And I do think that that uh, the last 12 months has, has shown landlords that they have to be flexible. It's no longer this game of uh, I'm the landlord, you're going to play by my rules and uh, you're going to take the space uh, that I want you to take. And that's going to be the end of the discussion. Uh, I do think it's become more conversational. And, and this is, goes back to my earlier point where that conversation hopefully uh, leads to better tenant retention because the tenant feels better served by the person that they're paying. And um, at the end of the day, that's what all landlords want because they want the cash flow of that tenant. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's a lot of what we're seeing. That's, that's, it's, it's interesting. And I think it, it, you know, it goes back to how do you manage your vacant space and uh, right. provide expansion space. And, and uh, you know, there's lot, there are layers, as you, you said, Corey, three different kind of buckets of, of what what uh, incoming tenants and their their employees are going to be looking for, and uh, um, so I, I, I guess as we we look at that, what are the what are the fundamental technologies that that need to exist that are uh, that owners should be thinking about for their buildings that can maximize the use of that that be their vacant space or underutilized space, um, so to enhance the the, uh, the retention and the experience of their of their existing tenants as well as attracting new ones. Um, but what are the what are the fundamental technologies that that really kind of have to be on the on the tour list? I'll, open question. I'll start. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll start off. Um, I do think in this era the the virtual touring has become a much bigger deal. So uh, not having to actually drive to the physical, physical space to see it, and then not just the virtual touring of, of let's just say like a 3D walkthrough, but uh, technology that allows a space to be kind of virtually mocked up. Uh, and so a tenant gets an experience inside of that space that yes, maybe current vac currently vacant or maybe even second gen or third gen space at this point, uh, but that tenant gets an experience to see what it could be for them. 
And, uh, you know, I look at, there's a platform called Swivel, which is out of Austin, Texas, which is uh, doing some interesting things with that type of technology. But all I think that does is just give the tenant uh, an initial understanding of what could happen. And that's so important, at least um, me again, taking my technology hat off and putting my tenant hat on. That's so important to me as the payer. And um, I'm wanting to know, you know, how do I, what is my space going to look like? What's going to be, what's going to be like for my employees? And is that a suitable fit for the culture and the type of company I'm trying to build? Great. Okay. But yeah, Corey. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think there's a couple. Of, one is like usage data, um, and I differentiate that from occupancy data. Like really knowing, you know, of our tenants, how many of them are using particular amenities, how many are using the conference spaces, the event spaces, how many are showing up to, you know, even the activation programs we have and the events that we put on. Uh, you know, that feeds into leasing discussions, but also helps us you know, come back to them proactively and offer them new products, new services and, and, and new space. So like that, the usage piece is really huge. And it, it also provides insights that a lot of our tenants don't even have. They don't realize that all of their employees use the gym or, you know, use the cafe or, um, you know, use the uh, kind of quiet spaces for, for meetings. Um, and the other is like cloud enabled access control, um, you know, centralized access control, really mobile for the end user, but being able to really programmatically turn on and off access, uh, you know, for us, that's critical as we start to open up the rest of the space to our tenants and say, oh, yes, you can go book a conference room or, or a desk to be able to unlock that for them immediately. And we don't have to have, um, you know, from an operations perspective, we're not having to increase our staff radically to kind of provide that more immediate access to space. And does that also mean then that your your individual tenant companies within your building are all on the same access control platform, or do they talk to each other? Uh, well, you know, within our app, we're just multi integrating across multiple access control platforms. So our building, okay, okay, you know, has, has a couple. Um, you know, working towards that being more centralized. But um, yeah, if you as a tenant and decide to book a space in that building or building across the street, we can unlock it for you and you can get into it with your app. Um, but it Got is it. currently a, a few different systems. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> still developing. The, just the way it is. Yeah. 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 No, it, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, how about from your point of view, Vicki, what are, what's the must have uh, items, technology items on your, on your list? I actually totally agree with uh, Corey's point that, you know, the actual usage or transactional data is actually very, very important because in the end, you don't want it to just, you know, be able to generate cash flow. You also want it to be able to create a playbook for landlords and tenants, you know, for them to understand, you know, what's the market today? What is my building's cost per square footage? What's useful amenities that I wanted to bring into the space to increase the retention rate? And then from the tenant's point, you know, you wanted to help them to find um, scalable and also tangible solutions in order to, for them to, you know, continuously looking for the right office space. Therefore, you wanted to provide them with the data that, you know, how often their employee come into the office space, which function or which kind of like room they actually booked more often. And also what type of function or tasks require actual workspace to be done more productively than working from home, right? So those kind of things, the data that you really wanted to be able to generate from the services that you provided in order to create more value for both sides. So that is, you know, the point that I just wanted to add on to Corey's. I totally agree with that. Okay. Well, excellent. Well, we're, uh, we're about to the end. I, I want to sort of ask the final question a little bit, uh, rephrase the one that that was on our uh, on our on our list of questions and that is um, stepping back from what we're what we're talking about today on, on technology and innovation in the workplace what's the what is the main objective that you your company wants to achieve on behalf of your customers and if you could if you could boil it down into uh, a, you know a, a couple of sentences um, that would help you as you evaluate various technologies, as you evaluate various platforms and you decide which ones to keep, which ones to really pursue uh, and which ones to, to let go. Um, 
what would you say is are those those key that key priority and objective that uh, you want to achieve for your customers? Vicky, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I think for, uh, from our perspective, providing a um, seamless kind of like uh, both physical, flexible working experience and, you know, through a seamless kind of like online digital experience. That's really the key that we want to achieve right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yep. Corey? Yeah, I mean, it's similar. You know, we're working to kind of help our tenants make the best experience for their employees. Um, and, you know, we're primarily focused on doing that through data. So giving them the insights to understand the employee experience and the experience in the space, as well as the experience that they're having from a remote perspective. Excellent. Okay. And for Kyle, how about for you? Yeah, we're on the other side of the, the aisle. So I'll speak to what our customers are wanting. Uh, our customers, similar to Corey, are, are wanting to provide the best experience possible for their tenants. Uh, that's their business. And uh, that's what they're good at. I think uh, from an internal perspective, not necessarily an external perspective for our customers, they also want better process and people management. Uh, so many people can be on disparate tools or in disparate uh, modes of communication and, and a lot of the value proposition dotted is vertically integrating teams into one location. So uh, from our customer's perspective, they view that as a value add as that uh, engages their employees better in one location uh, that hopefully uh, increases efficiency and transparency in the process. Um, and they see that as a big part um, and, you know, in the initial interface with tenants, but also uh, inside their own operations as they look to be better uh, landlords and stewards of the space that they have. Excellent. Well, I, uh, thank you very much. It's been very interesting to hear what each of you do and common themes on customer uh, in, uh, meaning, whether it's the employee of your tenant or whether it's the tenant themselves or whether it's, it's a, a building owner, um, engagement, convenience, satisfaction, and whether they are the, the one who's feeling the engagement and the satisfaction or whether it's the people they represent the fewer headaches they have, thanks to your technology and thanks to the services you deliver, the more effective their employees are gonna be, the more profitable their companies are gonna be. And uh, it's been really interesting to hear what all you each are doing in your respective industries uh, to, uh, to achieve that. It's been uh, very enlightening and hopeful, hopefully helpful for our audience. And so with that, we'll sign off and I'll just say thank you again for, uh, for participating today. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights and a special thank you to Brian for moderating and keeping us on track. That was an awesome conversation and I know the audience is giving a huge virtual round of applause. <laughs> So thank you again for sharing with us today. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.